talking about how you can incorporate your parent education in just your regular lessons rather than as like you know at the hub we do a course that the parents have to take but if you only if you take that as your only parent education then you're going to come unstuck because the amount of stuff that they retain is very variable and also you know if you think about a three hour course you took six months ago how much can you actually remember and then a year ago and then five years ago and then ten years ago in some cases they're still going after all that time which is great but um you know I think the most effective approach to parent education is that we really have to get our heads around the idea that when you've got a parent and a student in a private lesson, that your job there is not just to teach the child how to play the instrument. Your job there is the holistic um, you know, approach of parent education, checking what they're gonna be doing in practice, teaching the child, um, not just this is how my song goes, this is how I want you to play Allegro, whatever. Um, so, what, let's think first about, what do you think the, the core parts of parent education that have to be done in, let's say, the first term? So however you choose to do it, whether you meet with the parent several times before the child starts, that's what happens here um, now, uh, or whether you do something that is, um, you know, more sort of ad hoc, have a phone call with the parent or whether you just start the lessons and incorporate them into your lessons. Um, but let's say within the first term, what are the things that you feel are absolutely vital to cover um, in the first term? Are we talking at all about what they need to learn to support the violin or is this all just philosophy? No, anything to do with parent education. Okay. So all of it, yeah. Something about how to have parent control. Yep. Let's actually, let's see if we can make this in order. So what do you think the, the first thing, if you've got a parent who comes to you with a five-year-old and says, I want to start violin, and you say, oh, I'm free at four o'clock on Tuesday. Do you want to start next week? Just sort of like commitment of Suzuki education. The commitment of Suzuki education? Like on the term in the, like the commitment of the parent and like what Suzuki involves. Good, definitely. I'm going to put that a little tiny bit later. What do you think is the most important thing? If they know, you were assuming they know nothing about Suzuki. Should we know everything from resources? Yeah, but what are those resources going to tell them about? Um, Suzuki philosophy. Exactly, thank you, Hannah. Uh, in particular, which ones? Which bits? Mother tongue. Do you think that's the most important? What's the mo like? What do you, if you have to nut down what you think the most important thing for them to take away from their first lesson, or even from their first phone call with you? What do you think that is? What is Dr. Suzuki's key thing? That they're crafty individuals, and that actually it's more than just playing the instrument, um, and that it will probably involve some not buy-ins in the rest of the household, but that actually it's going to be. A tweak to your way of life to allow students to to read. Yeah, I'm looking for something even more fundamental than that. Do they have a violin box? Yeah. No. Love. There you go. <laughs> what are we? What are we? Do, what What is Dr. Suzuki's? And particularly then, which may or may not be in that parent's mind now, what was his big revolutionary idea? Devon. Um, There's three words. <laughs> I'm glad to say those are not the three words I'm thinking of. And your name is not Devon, you've got to stop talking about that. I can't put people on the spot if you just always give them the answer. <laughs> um, I couldn't give you the three words. Okay, the first one is every. Every. Who are we working with? Child. Yes. Three letters. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like fan. <laughs> Every child can. Can. Every, Every child, child can. can. That is the big way that it gets, you know, talked about in the Suzuki world. And like, if you're in America, that's actually the course that you take before you become.
a teacher, tra bit of a a teacher training um, and I've taken that course, it was very interesting. Um, but you know, his big understanding, his big kind of uh, revolutionary idea, like I said, was that it's about the growth mindset. That we're not looking for the kids who can naturally do something, we are teaching talent. We are the talent education approach, like that is... So the first thing that you need to get the parents to understand is that you believe their child can be a wonderful musician and you will show to them how that will work. Yeah? Because otherwise, if that's, like, that's the bedrock of our philosophy, isn't it? It's like, yes, we do it through the mother tongue approach, the mother tongue method is proof that we can, that, that was his kind of proof, but really, if you strip everything else away, you strip away the parent, teacher, student triangle, you strip away what the, what the group lessons and the individual lessons look like, you strip away the teacher training, you strip away all that stuff, if you come to, to it with an idea that Suzuki kids can learn to be talented, that is the kernel of it, isn't it? That's the middle of the onion, yeah? Whereas if you, t if you strip that away, what are you left with? You're left with a structure of lessons, you're left with a, a way of teaching, you're left with, you know, uh, nice holiday courses and, and group lessons and everybody having a nice time. But actually, what is the fundamental truth that we believe that is sometimes different from other teachers and what they believe, but also that underpins everything, all the reasons we do these things, is that you look at a four-year-old and you can believe that they will play beautifully. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if you take that away, then it's all just kind of padding. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that is that is really the most important thing. And you've got to remember that even though growth mindset is a big buzzword and loads of petite, loads of parents talk about it, actually I think if you could really interview all of your parents and all, and all of us, I think we, I, you know, I think I would have to hold my hand up and say that I still find myself making assumptions about what may or may not happen. I think less, much less so than it used to be for my students, but like in life generally, like, you know, you look at a six-year-old and you kind of find yourself making assumptions about what that six-year-old is gonna be when they're 16, 26, 56, right? Maybe that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it is though. Um, but some parents are really, really <clears throat> still very much entrenched in an idea that their child has been somehow hardwired and that they will be good at science, bad at maths, or whatever, you know, and we are really, you know, and you hear it all the time, oh, their granddad was a professional musician, so, you know, that's why we're bringing him to violin lessons. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know, maybe you're lucky, you will have a family culture of practicing regularly, great, that will really help, but in terms of, like, if you took that child and immersed them in anything, do we believe that we could make a fantastic scientist out of them? Do you believe that you could make an amazing pilot out of them? Do you believe that you could, you know, like, yeah, if we're going to be Suzuki teachers, we've got to believe that that is, that every young child has capacity to do almost anything. And that the way that we go about that is how you achieve that goal, not you find a goal and then, you know, find a way to suit it. Yeah? Good. So, I think every child can is a handy shortcut, but I think learn to be talented is the real point of that phrase. And if you're going to take, you know, certainly my um, social justice approach to it, that also has to be and should be given the opportunity. Because that's where it often doesn't tie together. Okay, good. So let's talk about what we're going to cover and then we'll talk about how, what resources and things we're going to use. So uh, what do you think you would do next if you're talking to the parent. Let's say you're talking, let's say we'll take the model that we use here because that's easy. Um, we have six parent lessons. Part of your job in those lessons is to teach the, the parent how to play 
the twinkles perhaps, or maybe just one, depends, you know, how much time and energy they have to put into it, how easy they find it, etc. But mostly those are to really bolster the parent education before the child starts. So what do you think is the next really most important thing? That they have to be patient and allow the child to progress at their own rate. Yes. And that they're experiencing it now. Good. Can you knock that down into something that sounds more like a Suzuki sort of soundbite? idea that their child no matter what's happening with that child at the moment will be able to like we've said before you know it's very difficult to put a kind of minimum thing on it but let's say definitely by the time they leave school be able to play a concerto really well even if it's size one which would be incredibly slow by most Suzuki standards um, but that's still an amazing achievement to play a concerto you know by 18 uh, so how we do that what does that actually look like? What does Nurture by Love kind of um, refer to? Creating. Yes, but how? Yes, in a broader sense, how can we refer to this? The mother tongue method is kind of the technique of how you teach that child. What do you need to put in place for, and one of the things that is mostly there when children are learning to speak without anyone thinking about it. The children are watching and copying. Yes, you're creating a positive nurturing environment. environment exactly. So nurtured by love. Creating a positive and nurturing, can't write, <laughs> it looks like nutmeg. Yeah. <laughs> okay, environment. Good, because out of that, then if we're thinking about a kind of, you know, the uh, water fountain of effects. If you have the parent on side that they believe their child can do this, they believe that they can do this with their child, then you talk about the nurture and the positive environment being fundamental to what's going to happen. Why, just throw out some reasons that the positive environment, nurturing environment is so important. Because you want the children to have a good, good and positive relationship with themselves and the people around them. Exactly. You want this to be a positive experience mm -hmm. and to build good relationships within the family, not to be, if you don't do your practice now, you're going to sit in your room until 6pm in the dark with your hands on your head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Devin, something else? Um, Even if it's really obvious, like why is a positive nurturing environment crucial? Just so that they can Exactly. Yeah. The number one risk to your child not becoming a child who can play whatever it is you want them to play eventually, or be whatever person you want them to be, is quitting. Yeah. And I think this is like this is so fundamental. Like if they stop, you've lost them. They'll never play. Like I said to one of my parents yesterday, they brought, um, in fact, Birdie, who's on lots of those lessons, and she said, you know, with Hal, I just feel like so often. He's just all over the place dreaming and we do a really good practice and then the next day it's like he hasn't ever even played that piece before. Whereas with Birdie I feel like it's much more like step by step, we do a good practice and the next day it's better. And I said to her like, A, I think it's really easy when you've got two kids, you know, three years apart maybe, two years apart, I don't remember, but to forget how the realities of practice with the first one because you've got the kind of 
um, blueprint oh, in front of you yeah. of how you hope it will be eventually. And also, you know, this this is it's not even a marathon. It's like a super marathon. You know, it's like a super marathon. Like in ten years' time. What is going to count about how your practice is and how it is with how is that you teach him even if it hasn't made a difference yesterday's practice we're still going to practice today even if it feels like it would be completely pointless to practice again because you've forgotten everything i said the point is we are still going to do the practice when things get difficult you don't quit i trust that even though it seems like it's all going around in a big you know messy fog in your head i trust that this will work and you know, all of those things turn you also into a person who's got perseverance and self-belief and self-confidence and da 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 da. But the point about it is that it's the only children who don't get out, you know, past a particular piece. Like she said, you know, sometimes it feels like whatever piece they're on, we're never going to finish it. And it's like, I've never had a student who doesn't finish a piece apart from the ones who quit. If you think, is this the, is, is this the piece that's going to stop me playing the violin? That would be a ridiculous thing to think, right? But that's the only time that they don't progress, is if they stop on that piece. Those are the only pieces they don't get through. Like, mm. even if they stop and give up on that piece and then go forward and then come back and do it another time, you know, like basically, there isn't a, there isn't a child in my entire 22 year career who hasn't finished a book who hasn't finished a piece, who hasn't made progress onto the next level, whatever that level looks like, whatever, however you're, you know, assessing it, apart from the ones who, who find it so difficult and, you know, so dispiriting that they quit. And I think that that is, like you said, that is the most fundamental thing that they've got to keep going. And so we have to keep that in mind all the time, like, like I keep banging on about, you know, the joy and the motivation are fundamental once the parent thinks, yes, my child can do this, the next thing is to keep it positive so that they don't stop, basically. It doesn't matter how many crap practices you do. If you keep going, you will be a child who can call themselves a musician. If you stop, it doesn't matter how many brilliant practices you did, you won't be able to call yourself a musician. Mm. Or feel like a musician. It's not even about calling yourself a musician, but you know. So creating a positive and nurturing environment so that they continue, so that they have a good time, because it's about the process, not about the end result, to turn them into better human beings. Mm. More ideas? Any more? Would it be a good time to also talk to them about how to manage themselves? Yeah. Because their tempo, their... their the parent, you mean? Just, yes. Yeah, very good. Their ability good. to step back and just get themselves into that space and yeah. maybe talk to them about change the environment they just seem to, it's not just getting the child in a different frame of mind it's getting yourself into a different frame yeah. of mind because you can shout at them that they haven't picked up their socks today again but when it comes to getting ready to do practice you've got to move that outside yeah Much and you've also got to recognize you've also got to recognize that you can't always park everything at the door you know maybe you've had a really rough day at work and you just think oh my god if that child doesn't do everything perfectly in practice i'm going to lose it and if you're in that state go into practice saying you choose five things that you want to do. All I'm going to do is tell you the things you did well. And then we get to the end of it and go, great, well done. Even if the things you did well are, you know, like you stood still while you were playing that one. You know, even if it's really basic, like, you know, some days you don't have the bandwidth to do a good practice. And like I said to Kirsty yesterday, if you feel that you're not in a position to do that practice well, Get a book off the shelf and say, let's do an improvisation practice. Let's put some sound effects to this story. 20 minutes later, done. You've done a practice. You've, you've proven to Hal that you continue to practice even when things are difficult. You have shown him that there are different ways to practice. It doesn't have to be, you know, five reviews and a piece of sight reading and two boxes and then your working piece. Like, you've shown him that you can be creative. You've shown him that you've got the capacity to adapt to how you're feeling, how he's feeling whatever you know that's really excellent modeling rather than i don't have it in me today so we won't do it or trying to do it and then ending up with both of you in floods of tears in different rooms in the house mm. <laughs> you know so yeah um good i'm not going to write all those things down but i think this is the kind of next thing and then what do you think we've come to now with this imaginary parent i really like that point sorry about being creative like encouraging them because some of the best ideas I, I get as a teacher aren't actually they're just plagiarized 
parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like they bring so much. Shared, shared, not plagiarised. Yeah, shared. shared. Um, but yeah. Devin, would you mind just taking the front door off the latch? I just realised it probably is still on it. Sure. Thank you very much. And just as like as teachers, we try and make it all our own. Each family, the more they can make it their own, the more interesting the like future of our music communities will be. Absolutely, and the more the present will be because they can share those ideas with their colleagues and with their teachers and with their friends here, and you know that like you know kind of leads to yeah. More, more ways to approach this huge task. <laughs> it's a huge task to grow a musician from <coughs> a family, especially if you're not from a, fam from a family of musicians where you understand what that kind of feels like, even if it's quite vague. You know, if you're, if you're a family who's never had something you do regularly, apart from go to school, brush your teeth, this is a huge undertaking. No wonder it, you know, has a vast variety of outcomes. But by every assessment sort of, that's such a like horrible Ofsted term, but you know, by every way that you can look at it, every different version of an 18 year old who's been through Suzuki, like can we imagine a situation in which you would say that's not worth it? Yeah, good. And, and really important. Really important. Huh? And a sound relationship with yeah. the instrument. Yeah, and a sad, like a sense of self that is um, like. Frustrated. Yeah. Yeah, or diminished, like you feel worse. And that is yeah. exactly right. And I think that it's very easy within Suzuki to feel like we've got to be positive and we've got to be, you know, nurturing, so therefore we don't talk about that. But actually, though, though that's exactly the argument that I say to every teacher if they have a situation where they're like, it's just not working and I don't know what to say to the parent, is what you say to them is, this is supposed to be a situation in which we are making you and your child closer to, for the child to have a better sense of self, confidence of self-worth, of self, uh, uh, of belief in their own ability, of uh, relationship with how to learn, and the, the possible failure of doing Suzuki does not look like you've only got to Martini Gavotte by 18. That would not be a failure. Mm -hmm. The failure looks like exactly what you uh, described, and mostly that does, there's a large overlap in the Venn diagram of not making progress and feeling like that. But it's not actually about the progress, is it? It's about the process and about what's happening. And that's why it's so important to keep talking to the parent and finding out how is practice going, not just it's fine, but you know, really digging in a bit. And that's why we have parent-teacher chats here once a year. Um, you know, how is the relationship between you and your child? Like, are you quite shouty in practice or do you find it easy most of the time to be encouraging? You know, how, like, what does it look like when your child plays up, um, etc. And I think, you know, there are lots of situations, and this can be a success of Suzuki, where you might say to them, I think what would be best for them is if you get a teacher to come to the house and they join the local, whatever, CYM or, you know, Hackney Young Musicians, something, because they've had a really good start, even if Suzuki doesn't work for them and they're falling behind and therefore they're at risk of all of these negative effects. They've had a very good grounding and they're probably still younger than most of the beginners. So then if you transfer them into that environment, suddenly they think like, <laughs> look at you lot on your open strings. I can play Minuet 1, even though maybe they're like 11. And so from a Suzuki perspective, Minuet 1 looks like, oh my goodness, you've been learning for seven years. How does that even happen? And actually, I would say that if you've got someone who's learned for seven years and they're on Minuet 1, then you should have made a change earlier because that is a real red flag. Um, but, you know, I think that we can give them a real gift by being the Suzuki teachers who can say, your child will feel great if you put them in this environment, and if you keep them in the Suzuki environment, they will feel worse and worse as the years go by. Because they'll be the big kid at the back, they'll be in with, you know, kids so much younger than them, and if that's not a problem for them, fine, great. But if, you know, mostly it is, mostly it does make them feel 
I'm happy at the violin and that kid's brilliant at the violin. Not, my parent hasn't worked out how to practice effectively with me. Especially when they get to school. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, if we think about your advanced student, who we're not going to name, okay. um, you know, here, I think it doesn't do great things for his self-esteem because he knows that he's lagging behind his peers. But we have kept him going enough to be in a secondary school where he is, like, outstanding mm. compared with everyone else. And I don't think that you ne necessarily rather need to move him out of Suzuki in order for that kind of double approach to balance itself out. Mm. And, you know... I know like quite a lot of my colleagues who became Suzuki teachers later and you know the older generation are always kind of slightly surprised by the kids who were really slow as Suzuki kids, the ones that seem to be at risk of this particular problem, then becoming Suzuki teachers and they're like, oh wow, that person, do you remember her? We just thought she would never learn size three or whatever it was. And then she's become a teacher and a very, you know, a brilliant teacher. I mean, this isn't a specific person, but that kind of, you know, feeling about there are quite a lot of people who weren't the superstars of Suzuki kids who are now really brilliant teachers. And so I think that is proof that it doesn't have to, you know, it, it can have a really positive impact on you even if you're not kind of safely in the middle of every class or safely at the top of every class. Like those kids like the one we were talking about is not necessarily being um, damaged by being one of the slow big ones because elsewhere in his life, he sees that even being one of the slow big ones here still makes him one of the really amazing ones elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it's not one rule, obviously. Of course, it's not one rule for everyone, but yeah. Good, so we've done the philosophy. We've hopefully got them, at least some of the time, believing that they've got a child who can be a musician, whatever, you know, and then you can have a whole conversation about what that means. We've talked about nurturing by love, how do we, what do we do next? This is all very lovely, isn't it? Everyone's feeling very enthusiastic and how wonderful it's going to be. Mm. Now what so do we need? Get them to get their calendar out and say, look, let's see what we can do about this. What space you have. Then you get to the how, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> and that's where you do the practicalities of schedules. schedules. Mm. What, are the, what are the things that we want them to <laughs> take on board as an ideal, even if they don't think that they can make it happen all the time. So we practice every day? Yep, yeah, great. Let's even just say daily practice. Good, keep going. Daily routines? Yep, yeah, very good. Joe? Um, thinking long, more, more basic, more basic structure of you know you imagine this is a parent who's had maybe three lessons they can play a bit of open strings on their violin and but they're really g'd up about oh yeah nurtured by love maybe they've read the book now uh you know they want to create a positive and loving environment at the moment they think that it's all going to be rainbows and unicorns with their four-year-old um, plan what time of day it's going to be and whether it's before or after school yeah planning good practice times very good uh, parents coming to every lesson. Excellent, yeah. Well, even just notes. like the lessons, mm. group lessons, private lessons. Yes, you have to come here twice a week. And if you're notes. teaching from your, you know, from your home or the local community centre, like, yeah, probably you won't be able to offer everyone their group lesson and their private lesson on the same day. There aren't enough hours, unless it's a Saturday. And then, you know, some people are going to have a big gap. So group lessons, private lessons. Good. Arriving early before lessons, wash your hands, that sort of stuff. Being prepared, good. I guess the one thing that you probably have talked to them about, I hope you have talked to them about, before you even get to this, is money. Because you need to get paid for your time, and although it would be lovely to run something I mean, once it is possible, like the parent education course, they pay for it, but they can also get a free place if they're a low-income family, and there's no requirement for them to then do Suzuki. So there are ways that you can have just a very, like, 
no commitment and talk about money. But if, you know, most people are in a situation where by the time they get a student, they want that, they want to know that it's going to work with that student at least on the basic level. So you say, my fees are £43 an hour, I will charge you this way, the group lessons cost this. And, and then they'll be like, group lessons and private lessons, oh my goodness, ah. And then you launch into all of this, how wonderful it is, and we'll talk about the money later. But, you know, if you've got a child who needs a bursary, then obviously you need to talk to them about that before you probably even meet. So I think that is a little bit of a kind of um, outlier. But in terms of getting further in, once you've got a parent who's coming every week. Can I ask if you have um, bursary families, what do you do about filing? I guess I just don't know. Um, well, most of the bursary families here are on the LSG bursary, so they get most of their lesson their private lesson costs paid and then they pay um, full price for at least the first year for their groups in violin hire. Okay. It's seven pounds a month for violin hire. Um, if there's someone who's proved that they're really committed and can't afford that, then I have on occasion given them a bursary or a discount on group lessons. Like especially if it's a si like our sibling bursary is automatically applied unless you earn more than 65 grand a year. Um, and that's 25% or 33% depending on the family's income. Um, but mostly we require them to do a year and then they can apply for further help. So it's like, it's gonna be expensive for them proportionate to their income for the first year, but they, if they, I would say it's more of a scholarship from us for group lessons after the first year rather than a bursary, which if anyone's not clear on the differences, a bursary is just, you don't have enough money to do it, here's some money to help you. A scholarship is mostly also a bursary, but, and you are proving that you've got commitment or talent or, you know, whatever. Um, so there is, a, there is an element of us testing before we give them our very hard earned money, of which there is not very much floating about, um, that they have to prove that they're committed. Um, and you know, do a year. And then, if they are, do they have to do the two group lessons if they're on lesson? So but basically, if they, it, I've never had a family, even the families who are on benefits, really low income. Um, we haven't had anyone who says so. If they're on a really low income, they'll get like ninety five percent of their best, of their lesson fees paid for by the LSG. And then we haven't had anyone who said that they can't afford the 77 a month on top of that. <laughs> now that there's a cost of living crisis, I'm sure we will. But so far, they've been able to find that money. So how much are they paying per month? 77. 77. Okay. Um, and then that will go down after the first year if they need it to. Okay. And then we've got lots of people paying like 25 instead of the 77, okay. once they've kind of, yeah. So quite a lot of people get family help or whatever from, from there. But you know, yeah. Most people on discount, on uh, benefits are still, you know, even if you've got two parents or a single parent or two parents on benefits, the amount of money that they tend to get is kind of 22 to 25 grand. So 77, you know, it's, it's not even, it's not a huge percentage of what, you know, of what they pay, mm. what they earn. And, and also when we're talking about this, one of the things that happens a lot on the bursary committee is you do have to remember that if you're on benefits, you don't pay tax. So actually, if you're on a 30 grand a year job, you're on the equivalent take home pay of someone who's on benefits, mm. which is stupid. And if I wasn't recording for YouTube, I would swear a lot. But you do have to remember that, that you know, basically you can add 25% onto whatever someone says they're on on benefits before you get a realistic amount of money what, what compared to salaries. What do you to your income to get benefits? That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but people, there'll be people who are earning like mid twenties. Yeah, and then they get tax. tax relief or whatever it's called. So they um, wouldn't be able to afford something like 80 pounds a month for their I mean, it seems like a lot to me. Yeah. Um, 
So, what else? What do you, do you think there's anything from this list of how you do it? Anything glaringly obvious missing? Daily practice, daily listening, planning your practice, your practice, group lessons, private lessons, note taking, being prepared. What's this one? I mean, that's not, I don't think that's, I mean, yes, you're absolutely right, they can't learn the violin unless they have a violin, but I don't think it's... I don't care of it, no. just don't, it doesn't make me into all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I'm thinking more basic to do with this. What can you lose between here and here? Positive exactly, exactly. How do you keep it positive? What are the things that we would say to new parents. What are those things that people need help to do? Smile, be positive and love yourself. Um, give the child some rewards if they didn't learn to practice. Good, yeah. Maybe give them a reward at the time. Yeah, time. using rewards, being positive yourself, finding the things they've done well. Sometimes that's really difficult for parents. What else do we use all the time in our beginner lessons with young children? Props. Props. Games, toys, you know, exercises that are not just you're going to play busy, busy, stop, stop on these string ten times. You know, ways to keep it fun, ways to make it child-centred, ways to make it engaging for young children. And stickers galore. <laughs> you know, the hula hoop game, like the fish. All of these things, your parents will not know about them when they first walk in your door. They're nutrition. But yeah, exactly. Just to, uh, any, uh, all of those things. All of those things. Um, good. So, if we imagine that we've got these lessons where we might talk about these, and then you think, okay, great, by the time I see that child for the first time, They've got a really, their parents got a really good understanding of what we're doing, how we're going to do it, you know, what the ideal situation is. Then how do we make sure that that isn't like a sand timer that you turn over on the first lesson and it just sort of gradually gets lost in the mysteries of, uh, you know, everything else they're doing in their lives. And six months later, you've got a parent who's shouting at their child if they don't behave in lessons. Good, excellent. More? Talk with the child as well. Yeah. Because <laughs> ask them, you know, how do you feel about practice? Does, do you shout at mum? Does she shout at you? Does she, do you shout at daddy? Ask yeah. Them, do you feel like they're helping you? Good. And because I, I think sometimes I mediate yeah. as well. So if the parents are there having certain issues, the child says, I don't like the way this is. Definitely. Uh, what do you think is um, one of the things in lessons that can help you avoid problems in practice when you're not there? Taking notes and making sure that they're referring to it in practice. Good, excellent. Because that takes the onus off the parent being responsible for the bad feeling. Yeah. Good. So good note taking, and then something that you can actually do. Video. Practice, yeah. practice with your parent in a minute. Exactly. Ask them to model what they're going to do at home. <coughs> can you go and make a bow hold with your parent? And then you see how effective that bow hold is, whether it's good. You see whether the parent is going, if they don't get it right, or whether they're, you know, like, or the, or the opposite. Oh my God, darling, that's brilliant. Well done, you're so fantastic. <laughs> You know, both equally problematic in terms of like learning how to do a bow hold, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think this is something that you know is really, really, really important. Teach something and then get them to practice it with the parent, especially early on, especially early on. Um, and yeah, check in, chat. Don't just do how was practice? Fine. How is this thing good? Okay, brilliant. Show me your working piece. You know, talk about what does that mean? Obviously, here we've got the practice records with P's and L's and like 
are literally up encouraging you to ask them how many times did you practice, how many times did you listen, um, but also how was it? Like, did you get through everything I asked? Am I setting too much? Am I setting too little? Is there something that always causes a row between you? Often sight reading. And often, if there is something that always sets off a row, that will be generally because it's too difficult for the child, it's too difficult for the parent, or they don't, they're not doing it at the right time in the practice. So either you're not supporting their knowledge enough for them to take it away and do it, i.e. if you say to them, okay, so I want you to do five pages of sight reading, and you don't actually look through the book and see that they're gonna go onto a whole new string, or they're gonna be, you know, suddenly have ties, or they're gonna suddenly have C naturals and C sharps, and you haven't prepared them for that, then of course they're gonna look at it and be like, I don't know how to do this. And that generally the mum or the dad is going to be like, come on, we said we, we would do it. And the child's going to be like, I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. Unless the parent is a musician, that is going to be stalemate. Um, if you set a box that's too hard for the child, they're not going to want to do it. You know, like I think my mum said, this is one of the things that kind of really made her think carefully about setting practices. Like you should never set practice that the child cannot do. And it's like, on the one hand, that's really obvious. On the other hand, that seems to be the point of practice, to learn stuff that you can't already do. So what does that really mean? What it means is they've got to be able to approach it, at least. Mm -hmm. And once they can approach it, and then it's the three Cs, right? Once you comprehend it, you can make yourself, your body cooperate to have it happen, and then you can consolidate it. If you send a child home with a box that they're on the first seat of and they think that they understand what to do but they cannot do it, then they're never going to get up that staircase. So then you need to make it easier. How much of your like, lesson time would, like per week would you spend on your home education? Or is it more per month if you check in the box? Um, all my lessons with Riker are on there, although it is slightly awkward with that family because they did Suzuki in America so there was a certain amount of knowledge already and also in some ways maybe I assumed a little bit of knowledge and in other ways I wanted to check that they didn't uh, have things I would disagree with or that I didn't assume too much so um, I guess you can kind of see from those lessons if you watch them but I think for me it's more like trying to just drop in occasional sentences that can make a really big difference. Like, like that chat I had with Kirsty about how and about, you know, learning in a kind of swirly way and, and in 10 years time it's not going to be whether you did good practice that Tuesday or not. That whole conversation probably took six minutes and that's probably the longest we've talked about philosophy or parent education in months. But but you know, I'll frequently say, if she comes and they've done three practices and they're like, oh, we've had a terrible week, we've only done three practices. I'll say, you know, the most important thing is that you keep going. Why don't you try for a certificate this week? And then the kids are generally really excited about doing seven, seven. And you know, don't beat yourself up about it. And that is like a 10 second piece of really helpful parent education to reassure them, to put them back on, you know, to put them back on this bit, this bit, sorry. Um, because I think it can spiral really quickly for a parent. If they have a bad week and then the, they don't get encouragement and understanding, and then they have another bad week, you know, it can take three weeks from everything being fine to a parent being like, I don't think this is working for me, we need to stop. It can be really, really quick. And I think that that is another really profound reason for us to be making sure that we're talking in depth about how practice is and about how the vibe is at home and not just assuming that it's fine. Because, you know, generally you'll have a really nice time in the lesson. Everything seems fine between the parent and the child. You've got no idea what it's like at home. Just like you can go out for dinner with a couple, have a lovely evening, think, oh, it's so nice, they're so happy together, and then hear that they've broken up a week later. Like, we've got no idea, you know. Um, so I think it's really important to keep checking in and to keep reassuring them. And I think also it's really important if you do get a parent who either says they're approaching wanting to quit or says that they want to quit to, to, to have this whole discussion again with them. Look, if you stop, you'll never get this opportunity again. It's very unlikely that you'll come back if you stop. We've had so few parents come back here and I've had so many say to me that they're just going to have a break. But 
if you just take whatever time you need within still the process of practicing and listening and coming to the lessons and we can build back up to having a really positive experience then you won't lose it all you know tell your child if they're saying that they want to quit tell them they can quit in six months time if it's still bad and then you spend three months making sure that by three months time it's brilliant and then they've forgotten about it within six months you know if you want to quit because it's too hard for you make a plan with your teacher to make it easier for you for the next three months and then see how you feel then don't just stop when it gets hard and that you know that's sometimes too confronting for the parents sometimes if you say to them you know this is what i recommend they just don't have like like i just said you know you never know what's going on in their lives maybe they're about to break up with their partner and they just think <laughs> Fun in practice, you've got no idea what's going on for me. You know, fair enough, fine. Um, but if that, you know, if there's not a big thing like that, I think that you can, most parents you can persuade to really give it one last go. And then most of the time, it's so much better after that, actually, for having gone through that. Um, so I think, you know, keep little drops of help, support, um, ideas, uh, and then in a bigger picture, where else can we do parent education? Group. Yeah, you've got a whole group of them sitting there, probably on their phones, probably not really paying attention. Okay, parents, can I just share with you an idea for you to do this week? Just look up for a minute, give me your attention, children sit quietly. You know, this is my, this is my idea to share with you this week. Can you try doing your boxes on every different chair in your house? Okay, thanks, go back to your Facebook. Like, you know, like something like that can just be transformative for a, for a child who's sitting in front of a parent who is like going, okay, one, do it again, two, it's so boring and the child's just like, oh, what are we doing? Whereas, like, okay, which, which chair do you want to choose next? Do you want to sit on it or stand on it? You know, and then it can, yeah, it takes two minutes longer, but it can be like really fun. So they're in a house with stairs, do it on every step. You know, can you do this standing on one leg? Can you do this standing on the other leg? Like... These silly things that we feel are like kind of obvious, like are so obvious, so not obvious to so many parents. And group lesson is the perfect place to share just tiny little tidbits like that. And also, why is it important for us to do sight reading? Well, because if your children can't sight read, they're only ever going to be able to play music that they've already heard. And that's like being able to, to speak a language but not be able to read any of it. It's a real disadvantage so I recommend that you do your sight reading second in every lesson and yes it's tricky and lots of children don't like it because it's not immediately rewarding but you're giving your child such a gift by just plugging away at it and by the time they're 15 they can just stand up and sight read whatever uh, and join orchestra and da 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 um, so why don't you try sight reading second every practice this week okay go back to your phones you know like those kind of things, just a 30 second sort of parent lecture <laughs> really can make a huge difference. Um, so I think it's, let's just make a little list here of how to keep the parent ed going. So in lessons and groups. How else? Emails. Good. Devon? Uh, what else could you do if you've got this information that you want to keep sharing with the parents? Uh, sessions where you check in once every few months or something. Yeah, exactly. Like a, a parent's evening on Zoom or in person. Very good. Hannah? Yeah. Yeah. So resources online, handouts. Yeah. If you read a chapter of Teaching from the Balance Point, and you think, "Oh my goodness, this is amazing." Photocopy it. Sorry, Ed. And give it to the parents in the next group lesson. Yeah. Uh, websites. Um, Podcasts, music. music, 
concerts. Exactly. I think that's the main sort of bit, the main sort of ways in which we do it, isn't it? And well, maybe events we could put more generally. So you might have a picnic with all your parents. It might not be an official parent education thing, but you might just be like, let's not have violins. Let's go to the Bluebells in May and, you know, just hang out all together. And then you'll have so many conversations, just like everyone who ever runs a conference says you need loads of breaks because that's where the real work happens. You know, you're sitting around a cup of tea and you say to your colleague, what do you think about this problem that I have? That's where you really get loads. Whereas, you know, a speaker, especially now with the internet being what it is, a speaker speaking their bit, you can do on the bus. But the connection, that's impossible to recreate anywhere else. Um, and you know, so yeah. Marcia is the other thing. Marcia! <laughs> Marcia. Yeah. Everyone should have a Marcia. Definitely. That's our receptionist in case you don't know who it is. Good, wonderful. Let's stop the recording. <laughs> Marcia! <laughs> Come on. Well, she's not, she's also been a new parent for like, how long? Yeah.